Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Toronto Center's uh, webinar on financial, uh, on pandemics and financial inclusion. We uh, uh, have about 250 or so um, uh, audience from around the world, viewers from around the world, uh, from Africa, Asia, Latin America, all over the world. So really welcome to this uh, interesting program. COVID-19 is a major global crisis. Uh, we are no strangers to crisis preparedness at Toronto Centre, and given the positive response we received to our recent pandemics and financial stability webcasts, where more than 200, uh, sorry, 2,000 supervisors tuned in, and due to high demand, we're also launching a new series on pandemics and financial inclusion. <clears throat> Unfortunately, more than 1.7 billion people in the world are still unbanked, and the majority are women. Therefore, financial inclusion is very important for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, especially during this period. IMF research suggests that risks to financial stability increase when access to credit is expanded without proper regulation and supervision. Therefore, investing in high quality supervision can pay big dividends as financial inclusion expands. This dovetails well with the mission of Toronto Centre and our interest in this dialogue and discussion. In today's episode, we sit down with two prominent experts to cover financial sector regulation and supervision, as well as the financial inclusion dimensions of this challenge. We circulated their bios to you in advance. Timothy Antoine is the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Banks and a former World Bank official. Greta Boll is the CEO of the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, or CGAP. She has a wealth of experience in development finance, and SMEs around the world, just to name a few. Both Greta and Governor Antoine are great partners of Toronto Centre, and I'm really delighted to see them again. Yesterday, we were uh, reminiscing that I just saw Greta in Cape Town at the end of January and the Governor in Ottawa in, in February, and already it looks like it was a million years ago. So it's fantastic to see them today. So finally, I would also like to thank our funders, Global Affairs Canada, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, IMF, USAID, Jersey Overseas Aid, and Comic Relief, without whom we could not achieve our global mission. Before we start, I would like to inform our viewers that we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible, and we have allowed the time to do that. Please type your questions in the Q&A tab, which you will find below the video screen. So let me start with a common question for both of you, uh, Greta and Governor, and welcome, by the way. Crisis matters. Over the past decades, World Bank literature has highlighted that financial crisis can throw millions into poverty. We all still have fresh memories of the 2008 financial crisis, but this one feels different. In your opinion, Governor, how is this crisis different? Well, Babak, let me begin by um, thanking you and the Toronto Center for arranging this, arranging this very timely conversation. Uh, I think the Toronto Center continues to add real value to developing countries, uh, many of whom I hope are on the call today. How is this crisis different? Um, I, I would say two things, fallout and fear. Because our world is so interconnected, no one has escaped this fallout. And because as of now, there is no vaccine, there is considerable uncertainty about the length and severity of this crisis, which is itself creating more fear. And that fear is palpable. So I would say those are the two things. If you look at the global financial crisis uh, of over, just over a decade ago, it impacted many, but not to the extent of this great lockdown, as it is now being referred, which has touched every corner of the global economy and every country in the global economy. So there is considerable fallout and fear. Having said that, it is intriguing to see how we are coming together, even as this pandemic conspires to keep us apart. One of my fondest images at this moment is to see how communities all around the world come together every evening to give applause, a musical expression, musical applause as it were, to our frontline healthcare workers. And so even in this moment of real adversity and anxiety, 
I see opportunity. Opportunity for us to do some things differently. And frankly spoken, the world has changed and we, need, we now need to embrace these opportunities in a new post-COVID-19 world. And, and because there is no vaccine, we are going to have to live with this pandemic or this uh, virus for a while. And so that is also something that we have to be very mindful of as we proceed. Great to see you again. And let me pose the same question to you. How is this crisis different in your view? Yeah, good morning and, and thanks for having me. So I, I'm just gonna try to build on what Governor Antoine said. Um, you know, I, I see four big differences um, between 2008 and where we are now. You know, first of all, this started out, I mean, it's a health crisis, right? And it, it started out um, in China and it, it's turned into a, a much broader economic and financial crisis. So we started with a supply shock in China and that's quickly turned into a demand shock in developed markets where we've been shutting things down. And we're now seeing this roll through a lot of emerging markets and, and you know, it's unclear how it's gonna play out there. So this is affecting entire sectors of the economy. We're just shutting things down. Um, and and it, it, you know, it's breaking down supply chains and it's leaving breathtaking numbers of people out of employment or income generating opportunities. Um, and it's happening overnight. It's happening so, so quickly. And, and, you know, just here in the U.S., I mean, look at the unemployment numbers. These are numbers like we haven't seen in 80, 90 years, right? So this is a very sharp shock and um, is kind of challenging us in a lot of different ways. The second thing, and this builds on what um, Governor Antoine said, is we're not fully in the driver's seat here, right? Um, you know, the timeline is completely unknown. I hear people talking about T plus one when we start rebuilding again. We don't know what T is. We don't know how long it's going to play out. And, and we have to sort of, uh, you know, tackle this in multiple ways. The 2008 crisis was financial, and so you could bring financial tools to bear, and you sort of could feel what the scope of the crisis is. This, you know, involves epidemiologists and, and tests, and it's just a much different kind of challenge. Um, I think the third thing is it's happening everywhere at once, right? So you could mobilize resource to solve a problem in a region or a country, um, but now we're having to solve that problem everywhere at once. And so, and, and you know, in, in 2008, there was definitely, you know, it, it came out in emerged or in developed markets, but then it rolled out and, and there was contagion in other markets, um, you know, moving into the Euro crisis. Um, here, that contagion is happening everywhere at once, both literally and figuratively as the virus spreads, but as the economic impacts spread, um, and that is going through supply chains, et cetera. And then just last, um, you know, we went into this crisis with record levels of debt both sovereign and corporate debt, because interest rates have been low for 12 years. And so I think as we're going into this, where we need really strong monetary and fiscal responses, we have countries that don't have a lot of fiscal headroom for that. And so that's going to put a, a big strain on our ability to respond to some of these challenges. So, you know, I, I think this is really not like a crisis any of us has seen before. Um, and in some ways, it's going to make 2008 look like a walk in the park. Yeah, it really, both of you are underscoring how this is really an unknown unknowns type of a crisis. None of us anticipated. And, and uh, one point that I think both of you referred to, which is we're all in it together. I mean, this is an interesting point that we got to keep in mind. So, Governor, um, let's step outside of the uh, Caribbean for a second and take a global view. You have many connections with your peers around the world. So I have a two part question for you. How has the COVID-19 pandemic influenced your thinking about financial inclusion globally? And second part, what do you see as some of the priorities for supervisors in the financial inclusion space under these difficult circumstances? Well, you know, Babak, I think <laughs> as I reflect on what is now unfolding, this pandemic has, to my mind, really made, a, 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 and is making, because it's still evolving, a compelling case for financial inclusion. You know, but it also illustrates why we must reduce the use of cash, but not eliminate the use of cash. Because the reality is that persons who have access to digital tools are faring better than those who do not in all aspects of life whether it's payments, whether it is health, whether it is teleworking, whether it's um, education of children, persons with digital tools are faring better. And on the contrary, uh, the converse, those without those tools are disproportionately impacted uh, by, by this pandemic. 
So there is a real need, a real urgency, I would say, to stay connected and, and to connect the unconnected. And, um, we, you know, I've seen situations where persons who are completely reliant on cash and checks find themselves unable to access banks and financial institutions because they are shut, as a consequence of which they are stuck with checks and cannot get cash to buy food. I've seen that in some parts of the region. Um, and so I think there is a real case now for us to really look at how we can accelerate our financial inclusion agenda. Interestingly, at the Central Bank, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, where we were piloting a, a digital currency pilot before uh, the pandemic, I am getting calls for us to speed up that work uh, as a result of and recognizing the need for financial inclusion. So in terms of regulator priorities, I would say the first priority is appropriate regulation in this period. And that means some flexibility, working with uh, licensees. Uh, so for example, many licensees have now had to provide a moratoria with respect to debt arrangements, servicing arrangements, and the regulator has had to work in collaboration with to ensure that we give uh, appropriate cover in this period. So some forbearance, some relaxation, some flexibility. I would also say that the regulators uh, have to speak together and really collaborate very closely in this period to ensure that as much as possible, we manage what is essentially an international problem. In other words, it's a global problem. It requires a global response. It needs to be coordinated. It needs to be joined up. So I would say those are two of the immediate priorities for regulators. Um, and, and I would also add, in this moment, the need for financial literacy. I, I know it sounds difficult in this environment, but even as we speak about re increasing uh, access to payments and to financial services, especially for the poor and for female herded households and the disadvantaged, you also have to accompany that with financial literacy support. Great, so I'm gonna steal uh, one of your quotes here, which you said, stay connect, connected and connect the unconnected. I think that's actually sums it up quite well. And you also uh, promoted whole need for coordination and cooperation amongst regulators and looking at appropriate application of regulation. So with that in mind, let me turn to Greta. Greta, what do you see as the main risks from COVID-19 for financial inclusion? And are there also opportunities out there? Yeah, um, I think they're both. Um, maybe let's start with the risks, Howard, because I think they are very real. Um, you know, financial inclusion involves multiple financial services. It involves payments, but it also involves credit savings and insurance. Um, and, you know, those who have followed the financial inclusion movement know that actually this started four decades ago with microfinance. Um, and we're seeing real risks emerging around the microfinance movement because of course any entity that is making credit or issuing credit is at risk. If people aren't earning an income, they're not able to pay those loans. And um, you know, we've invested for decades in this microfinance movement. Um, and we're really worried that we're going to lose some of these providers. So right now, as of the last data that we have, the microfinance sector reaches 140 million um, low-income people across the world using a pretty conservative estimate. And that represents about $124 billion in loans outstanding and $80 billion in savings mobilized, all from low-income people. Um, and it's an investable asset class, right? So there's about $17 billion invested um, from international entities, as well as multiples of that in domestic credit lines. Um, and we see a couple of risks around the microfinance sector. One is, you know, as regulators are stepping in and sort of um, offering forbearance measures, sometimes that's being extended to just consumers or businesses and not kind of going up the chain. Um, many regulators are kind of looking at that and putting in, in, in measures that, that help on moratoria and on relaxation of some of the regulatory ratios. Um, but sometimes that safety net doesn't extend to the microfinance institutions. So if you're a deposit taking bank regulated microfinance institution, maybe. If you're a non-bank financial institution, maybe not. And then you have a whole category of credit unions and cooperatives and NGOs that are also doing this that aren't necessarily covered by some of those measures. So there's a 
regulatory aspect to it, but there's also an investor aspect. Um, and, you know, as investors sort of look to their own bottom lines, there is a concern that some of them will sort of want to protect their investments and, and walk away. And we see a risk of sort of cascading, um, you know, calling of debts and, and, and um, putting those institutions under, under further strain. You know, there's a need in the near term for operational liquidity. There's probably going to be a need to sort of hibernate some of these institutions while we ride through the crisis. And then there's going to be a need to rebuild. And so, um, you know, we're working, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, with the investor community to think about a coordinated response. So it's not kind of a race for the bottom, but we are actually supporting the institutions that we've invested for 40 years in building up. So that's kind of the microfinance space. I think the other space is on the payments side. Um, and so, you know, in the 12 years since M-Pesa kind of came out, we've seen an explosion in, in including people um, using payments mechanisms and mobile wallets. And that's been really important. But I think we see um, both opportunities and risks around that. So a lot of governments are looking at, um, you know, getting money out to people using the, the payment systems that have been developed. Um, but a lot of people sort of forget that those payment systems aren't totally digital. It's not like I receive money on my phone and I can use it on my phone. The behavior is, is I receive money on my phone and I go to an agent and cash out. And that agent is a shopkeeper who is down the street from me who has to keep his shop open. So one of the things that we're seeing is that sometimes when there are big lockdown measures, those shops are being closed. So people can't actually cash out. Um, but when they do stay open, we're also seeing governments saying, right, we're going to get money out to people, but hey, mobile network operator, you can't charge for it, or we want to put caps on what you're charging. And that really undermines the business model of these um, entities that have built up the capability to distribute cash. There's also an added pressure, because if you have cash going in one direction, it's just a massive flood of, of cash going out um, and that causes real liquidity pressures for those operators and so i think there needs to be um, good public private partnerships as we think about putting together these social protection measures that can help get money out to people and make sure that the operators still have business models at the end of it that stand up because they've been so important for building financial inclusion in terms of opportunities i think there are real opportunities so the inclusive finance sector both microfinance institutions and these payment companies reach a lot of low-income people so as government think about getting aid and support out, whether in G2P payments or, you know, loans like we're seeing here in the U.S., kind of subsidized loans that are keeping businesses afloat. Those are a great channel to get money out to those informal small communities. They have really strong relationships and they're able to do it. And I think, you know, beyond that, there are some other opportunities around digitization, but I think we'll get to that in a, a later question. Thank you, Greta. That was actually a very interesting panoramic view you provided us here. Very helpful. So Governor, coming back to you, uh, you know, we live in the world, but everything at the end of the day is local. So let's uh, turn our attention to your local region. In the context of financial inclusion and the Caribbean's response to COVID-19, what issues are preoccupying the minds of uh, policymakers in your area? Well, without though, the first um, question is an issue is, is the health of our citizens. How we protect our citizens, residents and citizens from uh, COVID-19. And it is no secret that in many of our countries, small states such as we have in the Caribbean, our health systems have had, continue to have pre-existing conditions. In other words, they're not the strongest systems in the world. So that is why there's been this uh, move very early to preempt spread by lockdowns. Uh, effectively shutting down the economy. Um, so that is the first issue, protect the health of citizens and residents. But there is also the issue of, and in this region, of course, tourism is the largest earner for an exchange and a big employer, a big uh, generation, a generator of employment. So tourism is shut. So the, I mean, you could well imagine the impact on the real economy, on employment, on government revenues in this period. And so another issue that is occupying the attention of policymakers is, is the health of the economy. So you have to protect citizens. That's the first priority. I think there's clarity on that. But how do you work towards some kind of resumption of economic activity such that this economic disruption does not morph into a financial crisis? 
That is a real issue. And of course, um, if we are going to eventually have tourism resume, and we don't know what the demand will be for that given the global situation, what will be the protocols around which uh, we'll be able to allow uh, visitors back into our countries? So that's, the, that's occupying the mind of policymakers right now because we have to develop common protocols. So for example, does it mean that a, a visitor, a tourist takes a quick, a rapid test before boarding a flight to determine whether or not they take the flight? What would be the arrangements of the airlines? When you arrive in country, how are you going to be treated? Those are real issues uh, which are occupying the minds of our policymakers. In addition to that, it's a whole question, and Greta mentioned it, because many of our countries, and this is not just in the Caribbean, but around the world, have very limited fiscal space. Governments, countries have to make very hard decisions about how to allocate those scarce resources. And so, for example, one of the questions that one has to ask is, does this business require liquidity support? Is this a liquidity problem or is this a solvency problem? Because if it's a solvency problem, you have to make the hard choice of walking away. And that is not an easy decision to make. And, and, and of course, the longer this drags on, the more likelihood you have of liquidity situations becoming solvency situations. So that is a real issue. The final thing I'd mentioned briefly is connectivity. We go back to financial inclusion and this whole question of connecting people, staying connected and connecting the underconnected. We know, we always knew, but that is now very uh, in sharp focus that connectivity is a driver of inequality. And so those who are connected have more opportunity and more access, and those who don't uh, uh, do not have access. And what is happening now is a real focus on how can you quickly make connectivity available, accessible, and affordable in this period to ensure that you, as far as is possible, leave no one behind. Those are just some of the issues that are preoccupying the minds of policymakers in our region, and I suspect many, many countries around the world. Absolutely. I just uh, take off from your last sentence, many parts of the world, because what you underscored is that local is global, global is local in this context. Like everything you said, I think if you talk to people in other parts of the world, they probably will you'll hear the echoes of precisely what you just said. Greta, turning to you, uh, let's talk about cash for a second. Governor talked about cash as one of his opening comments here. Because, and, and again, this really brings the financial and public health dimension of this together. Because it is easily contaminated, cash is considered untouchable during this crisis by many. In your opinion, how might the crisis accelerate the use of digital financial services and what are the challenges? Yeah, um, before I answer that, I'd like to just touch on something Governor Antoine said, because I think it's really important. I, I think solvency is going to be a huge issue, and that's really what we're worried about. I mean, if you look at the United States, we've got big names going down, <laughs> like big retailers are in trouble. You know, South African Airways is going into liquidation. Like, this is hitting already, and there are going to be some really difficult deci decisions that have to be made. And I think our big concern is we want to make sure that the inclusive finance sector is not at the back of the queue. Um, because I think there is some risk around that. And so that's a little bit what we're mobilizing to deal with. But to your question on the um, on the digitization, I think it is going to create um, in some ways a push for digitization. And in some places, I think it's going to be really difficult. So as I was talking about before, you know, we think about digital finance as being this purely digital thing, but there's this big cash distribution piece underneath it. And I think what we're going to see in this crisis is um, who's prepared and who's been investing in those systems and they'll be able to leverage it and who's not. And I, I think it's going to go a few different paths, right? So uh, you can see countries like India and Peru actually being able to mobilize to get lots of money out to people um, through the systems that they've invested in. You see other countries, Lebanon is one, where they're trying to figure out how they're going to get this money out to people, right? So they're looking at bringing in the army because that's the best way they can think of to sort of distribute the cash. Uh, and then you have countries that are kind of in the middle, like Indonesia or Nigeria, where you could make a fairly simple change to the regulation and you could turn on a distribution capability pretty quickly. But that's still really cash heavy, right? And so I think the, the pathways we're going to see in terms of this playing out are, are kind of three. You're going to have one, which is pretty advanced countries like India and Kenya, for example, 
where you've already got people who are used to using digital means, they're comfortable using digital means, and it's very likely that this will tip them into more kind of fully digital behavior, right? So if you take a, a Kenya, um, it's just as easy to pay for something. Right now, the behavior is baked in where I go to an agent and the agent is incentivized for me to cash out and for me to give the cash back to that agent because of the way the business model is structured. What we're starting to see in Kenya is that there's more paying by P2P with that. And that's where this changing of the pricing model really needs to be carefully thought out because what you want to do is incentivize greater digitization. Moving into merchant payments in East Africa has been a pain point for years. We've been trying to get that to happen and this could be an impulse to, to make it happen. I think you'll see that in places like India as well where people are pretty comfortable with the digital means. Then I think you'll have these kind of middle of the road countries where they just don't have that infrastructure in place but they could and if, they, if they're if they smart and they, they need to kind of get money out to people they'll switch on that infrastructure. So you know in Indonesia you could sort of enable the Gojeks to do cash out and sort of make that happen. And you may find that, um, you know, people do keep the money digitally and they're able to do that with the existing kind of infrastructure in you know, Nigeria could be very similar. And then you're going to have the countries that just haven't invested in this at all. And they're just going to have to struggle through. And I, I think, you know, building that kind of acceptance infrastructure, because, you know, the reason that you have cash in cash out is you can't use money in your phone. It's an abstract thing. You can't use it unless somebody's willing to accept that payment from you on their phone, you can't use it. And so the merchant infrastructure is just not in place in most places. Now it could leapfrog into just quick P2P payments infrastructure, and, and but that's a real behavior change. And we'll see it in some places and we won't see it in others. So we're just gonna have to um, you know, figure out how to roll with whatever situation we started with and then um, build from there so one of the things that we got spared in this pandemic is uh, a loss of electricity and electrical grid imagine if that was the case then we would have a much different conversation about cash and all that but governor building on what greta said in terms of acceleration of uh, digital infrastructure digital payments uh, how is your region dealing with the issue of cybersecurity? because that's the other dimension of it and resilience for financial sector uh, regulation and supervision. Like, is this posing a challenge? Will this pose a challenge? Um, any any perspective you can offer, that would be great. Right. So, so Babak, it was always a challenge uh, pre-COVID-19, but it's, it's really now, um, again, in sharp focus because we already know uh, from reports that attempts to hack systems, uh, financial systems, government systems, health systems, uh, those attempts are up. And... Um, as unconscionable as, as it would seem, you do have in this moment illicit actors who are trying to take advantage of a very, very difficult situation in our countries. So the issue of cyber security and cyber resilience is, is very, very important. And it goes to the issue of trust because the, the real agenda for financial inclusion requires that we bring the unbanked and the underserved into the financial system and, and, and to ensure that they have access Many of them are reluctant in some cases because of suspicions about data security, privacy, uh, and of course, of course, lack of opportunity. So you want to maintain or you want to build and maintain trust. And to do that, the cybersecurity and cyber resilience is extremely important. Having said that, what do we know? We know for a fact that oftentimes the weakest link is inside. And that is why even this moment of of, 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 of significant use of, of digital tools, uh, we are encouraging people to be careful with their passwords and, and how they use it to ensure that they do not create opportunities inadvertently for illicit actors. Within institutions, including our central bank, we continue to ramp up our public edu our education and training of our staff, you know, cyber hygiene, because that is so important in this period. I mean, without a doubt, Digital tools have been a lifeline in this pandemic, but we have to make sure we protect our use of these tools with proper cyber hygiene. And so that is very important within the institutions. I would also mention that amongst regulators, information exchange is critical. And many of us have set up protocols to share information. If there's an attack somewhere or there's an attempt, we share that information and we learn from it. We know what it looks like. We know what the, the, the parameters or the dimensions may be. And we try to avoid that happening in any way else. 
And that's extremely important. You can't operate in secrecy here. You have to have protocols to share information promptly. I would also say two other things. There is a necessity, especially at the organizational level and within regulators, to undertake independent assessment, independent reviews of your cybersecurity stance. And that's that, that is what we've been doing in the ECCB. That's what other, other, other uh, sectors or other regulators are also contemplating. Because you cannot allow complacency. You have to continually keep enhancing your cybersecurity um, uh, apparatus and your resilience framework. And the truth is, in many cases, our approach is to say, while we want to avoid an event, we need to prepare for an event and ensure that we can recover in the shortest possible time if and when an event occurs. And the final thing is cooperation with governments, both within country and across countries, because these illicit actors operate across borders. They, they do not respect boundaries and borders. And therefore, to be effective in our cybersecurity um, fight and, and to build resilience, we have to cooperate across countries and across borders, regulators, governments, and the private sector. And those are some of the things that we've been doing and are working on even now in the Caribbean. Great, thank you. So uh, kind of some of the same measures that we need to use to protect ourselves against the virus, uh, hand washing, others are applied <laughs> precisely to the cybersecurity uh, space mm -hmm. as well. Thank you for that. And the talk about cooperation is very apropos as well. Greta, this is my last question is to you and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience uh, because we have a few questions, good questions. Greta, could you please tell us how CGAP is adjusting its plans and projects in the wake of COVID-19? Yeah, so just um, sort of speaking to the risks and opportunities I talked about before, we've really focused our attention on both of those things, right? So we have a couple of things going on in the microfinance space. We are working um, with our colleagues in the World Bank to understand what's going on um, on the regulatory side and trying to just get some information together and out about best practice in terms of how regulators are dealing with the microfinance sector. You know, are they being left behind or are they caught in that, that safety net? That, that governments are putting together. So working um, on the regulation side and, and, and connecting with the microfinance sector and understanding how that's impacting them. We've also got an effort going on with microfinance investors. So what we wanna do is make sure that there's a coordinated response to this crisis so we don't have issues around a race to the bottom. And, and you have kind of different layers of investors, right? You have the MIVs, the um, microfinance investment vehicles, you have behind that the DFIs, and behind that you have the donors. And as we get into solvency issues, we may need to be able to tap into some of those more forgiving sources of capital to keep the sector um, afloat. So we're engaging in a conversation with the investor community that involves those different layers, trying to think of a coordinated response so that we're, we're bringing as much of the sector through this crisis intact as we possibly can, and that we're mobilizing our funds and, and making use of every dollar that we've got available to get the, the sector through this. We'll also be looking to get some advice out to um, microfinance institutions on how best to respond to crisis. There's a lot of good experience and knowledge on that. So that's one body of work. Another one is on this um, G to P and distribution piece. So how do we make sure that the, the capabilities that we've built over the last 12 years on the payment side to get money into people's hands safely and securely and usually using digital means remain intact, that they evolve and they develop um, and that we are able to kind of ramp them up and get um, money into people's hands when they need it. I think there's also opportunities in markets that have lagged behind and really trying to help them get on the, the ladder on digital finance so that they can really build that capability as well. Um, in both of these areas, I think there will be opportunities for increased digitization. So at the back end of what we're thinking in our T plus one universe, we are really thinking hard about, you know, how we can in, in incentivize digitization, further digitization. So on the microfinance side, I think there's a ton of work to do. And a lot of them are doing it right now in terms of, you know, leveraging call centers. This is a really face-to-face -face industry where people meet in groups. That doesn't work anymore, right? So they're really having to scramble and think about how they use digital tools a lot more effectively than they have in the past. And I think as we go into the recovery phase, and if new money does come into the microfinance sector, it really is going to have to drive a new digitization agenda in that sector and, and some cleaning up of how they've operated. Similarly, on the, on the digital finance side, it's really about moving towards that merchant payments and keeping money circulating more digitally so that we aren't, you know, 
managing these huge cash in cash out footprints. That's going to be a really important transition for a lot of these operators to make. Um, a third area that we're looking at is customer insights. So how are people responding to the crisis? What do they need? How is this impacting women or rural communities? And just really understanding how, um, how people are dealing with it and how solutions that are being put out are helping or not helping them so that we can capture some of that learning um, in the event of future crises and build it into more resilient business models going forward. And then last, you know, we've, we're a community platform, we're a donor consortium. And so we've got a lot of material out on both cgap.org and on the FinDev gateway that people can tap into, you know, what have we learned from past crises? What are we learning from this one as we go along? It's sort of a community site. So if people have materials they'd like to put on the FinDev gateway, I can put you in touch um, with our editors there. We do it in um, English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Uh, it's a great resource, and we're also putting out our own material on cgap.org. Well, Greta, that was, uh, that was excellent. So you uh, really have your hands full, and you know what, as I mentioned at the top of the program, CGAP is a great partner of Toronto Center, so we're very happy to be able to help you in any of these areas that you're doing, so it's very reassuring to hear that. Uh, before I go to the audience questions, and we have quite a good number of questions here, I just want to make an announcement that on April 29th, uh, we have uh, Reza Baghir, the Governor of Central Bank of Pakistan, and Chela Pazar Spayoglu, uh, Senior Vice, Vice President at the World Bank, at our next uh, episode of sorry, Pandemics and Financial Inclusion. That's going to be at 9 a.m., and you'll get uh, announcements and notices about that, so please tune in for that. So let's go to the questions. Uh, I think this one probably should go to you, Governor. The question is, what measures are being taken to unite the various regulators to deal with the threats to the financial system, such as the current one? And in fact, that's an appropriate question because that's how you started your answer, talking about the importance of coordination. Indeed, indeed. So, so Babak, a lot, of, a lot of discussions are going on um, around the clock. I mean, I, 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 there's no distinction between weekdays and weekends um, at this moment. Um, not that there was much work-life balance before the pandemic, but there's certainly none right now. So the regulators are constantly speaking to each other, um, sharing our ideas, sharing our experiences, sharing our issues, and sort of thinking through some of these challenges together. And it is really important in this period that we remind ourselves we are not in this alone. We are in this together. We are fighting a war together and together we will overcome. And, and there is comfort in knowing that we're not alone. So there's been a lot of discussion at the level of the regulators about regulatory treatment, for example. Um, so in, you know, the central bank regulates banks. We do not do credit unions, but we are collaborating with regulators because it's the financial system and ultimately you know, the, the credit unions, for example, are an important part of the system. So we are speaking to credit union regulators. We are speaking to regulators of insurers and, of course, banks and, and making sure that together we give the best possible response to protect the financial system and to preserve financial stability. So a lot of it is exchanging of information, uh, sharing of what we're going to do, uh, coordinate, coordinating our efforts to get the best results. And I dare say, at the international level, a lot of that is required. And we're seeing some of that already with the major central banks working together. Uh, we're seeing the, we saw the IMF uh, and the World Bank last week with their announcement to G20. And a lot of it is just policy coordination, uh, recognizing that individual countries cannot do it. Because we found that even the largest countries, they have been uh, almost overwhelmed by the, the rapidity of the, of the, of the pandemic. And, and, and of course, the disruption in the supply chain and so on. So a lot of what the regulators are doing uh, is, 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 is coming together, working, collaborating, communicating, and also um, agreeing you know, as far as we can on regulatory forbearance and flexibility. Because in this period, we have to work with licensees to ensure that we give them the space to recover. And, and that, uh, that is, that is uh, something that we're working on continuously at this time. That's great. Actually, it's very reassuring to hear that from you, Governor, because if you recall, you and Greta recall in the beginning stages of this crisis, there, was, there didn't seem to be a lot of coordination on the part of the world governments, let alone the financial system. 
it was more like as if the trade infrastructure architecture of the world was being dismantled by certain world leaders. And then all of a sudden we were caught flat footed, no major G20 announcements, no major G7, but I'm really glad to see and hear from you. And also based on what else we know that at least in the financial sector, uh, the ones uh, behind the levers are pulling together and trying to you know, create some semblance of order and coordination. So that's very reassuring. Greta, I'm going to give the next question to you, and I'm wondering if you could give it more of a financial inclusion um, lens. What changes do you see as necessary to the current financial architecture to make it more resilient to a crisis? I guess I take this to be to future crises as we're learning about this one. Yeah, um, you know, the simple answer is I, I think we need to make it more inclusive and more robust. Um, so on the more inclusive, you know, to the extent that we can really get people into the formal financial sector, that's a huge benefit, right? Still, we have billions of people who just have no connection whatsoever to the formal financial sector. And that makes it really difficult when we're trying to get money into people's hands to actually reach them. I mean, if you're operating purely in cash that you keep stashed under your mattress, there's um, not much you can do. Uh, and, and, you know, even, you know, we don't sort of think about microfinance always as being part of the financial sector, but it is, right? So you look at um, what happened in Andhra Pradesh when they had the, the over indebtedness crisis there. When money came out of that market, the overall market went down, consumption reduced, casual wages reduced. If you take, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but if you take liquidity out of a market, that market reduces, right? So poor communities need financial sector resources just as much as everybody else, right? And so I think um, building that inclusive financial system that reaches everybody, whether with payment service, savings, credit, insurance, is going to be really important. And, and you know, there's always been this sort of discussion about there being trade-offs between inclusion and stability. I think it's been pretty well documented now that that's not the case. Actually having things in the formal financial sector where you can see them, you can monitor them, you can protect them in times like this is really, really important. So making sure those umbrellas extend to the full financial sector is going to be really important coming out of this because then we have something that's protective for everybody. But, you know, speaking to um, a point that Governor Antoine made earlier, we also have to make sure that these systems are robust. So, you know, we've got digital financial services right now that are pretty cobbled together by mobile network operators that are running massive payment systems. And we need to really be investing in these to make sure that they are secure um, from a cybersecurity point of view and, and making sure that people's money is protected. Consumer protection, we haven't talked about that much um, other than financial literacy, but that's so important as we touch more people with financial services, we need to make sure that those services benefit them and that they're not getting you know, ripped off by providers. And so I think there's a lot more we need to do to make systems robust. And to do that, we need to bring them in the formal financial sector. Very good, thank you very much, Greta. And it's interesting because if you go back to the great financial crisis of 2008, that was definitely on the banks and financial institutions and we saw what happened. And this one, they were all collateral damage, but nonetheless, it talks about the importance of maintaining the integrity of the system. Governor, we have some very creative people in the audience and viewers, and uh, it's an interesting question. I'm gonna pose it to you. Uh, if we move to digital systems or rapid expansion of digital system as a result of this pandemic, what will happen when we get a digital meltdown contagion, a digital financial pandemic? So one of the things that a legacy benefit, if you will, of this pandemic is pandemic planning. So that's not just for health systems, but for financial system, including our digital systems. And so that is why I said at the top that while I feel uh, this pandemic is making a compelling case for financial inclusion and reducing our use of cash, I was very clear that we cannot eliminate the use of cash. And so in terms of uh, pandemic planning, in terms of uh, scenario planning, we do have to give ourselves the redundancy um, uh, capability. In other words, if the system is down, how do we function? What can we do? That is something we always have to consider. So we think about how can we quickly bring the system back online, but we also think about what are the basic things that we must do if the system is down, you know? And, and, and that, is a, that is a cost, if you will, of resilience. 
In other words, it cannot be all or nothing. So I think we are well able to design a system that allows us to have some capability in the event of a digital um, meltdown, as you put it. But there's no going back. I mean, there's no way we can stop the clock and say that we're not going to go forward with the digital uh, transformation. I think what is important is that we learn the lessons of this pandemic and we make appropriate plans. Um, in many of our systems right now, I mean, we have, you know, it's like a generator. You have a generator, it goes down, you have a backup. In, in our system, we have three sources of energy. So one phase, you go to the other, the other one phase, you go to the other. So I think we can build that into, into our planning. Uh, and that is going to be important as we go forward. Uh, and also important for not just building trust, but maintaining trust. Because invariably, inevitably, systems will fail. Systems will have downtime, you know, and you, you cater for that. But I do not believe for the slightest, in the slightest, that we must back up from moving forward with the digital transformation. And let me be very clear. When it comes to countries, especially poor countries and small countries, the fighting chance that we have to compete in the global economy is in fact to move forward with digital transformation. So this should not cause us to resile or retreat from. We must advance, but we must advance smartly with armed with the lessons of this pandemic to ensure that we build in resilience in whatever we do. And I think we're capable of doing that. Yeah, and a key part of building resilience is always making sure your business continuity plans are updated and keep updating them. And that's something that we did at Toronto Center in terms of uh, adjusting to this uh, pandemic. But also for our viewers, uh, some of you may know, we have created communities of practice on business continuity planning. Please contact us, crisis at torontocenter.org. Center is the English spelling of center. And, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of resources for you there. So what you said was very appropriate. Greta, um, as, a, as the chief uh, advocate for financial inclusion, I think this question probably should go to you. Do you think providing universal basic income to underserved communities by digital means is an effective way to improve financial inclusion that can also help these communities through these difficult times? Yeah, um, can I actually come in on the prior question and then go to that one? Because I think the prior question is a really interesting and thought provoking one. And I agree completely with everything Governor Antoine said, and I would just add maybe a twist. Um, because if we go back, you know, a few months ago, which feels like a whole lifetime ago to before this whole thing happened, you know, we had a financial sector that was innovating like crazy. So there, you know, fintech and digital is making everything very different, right? So what we're seeing is a massive kind of disaggregation of the financial services value chain and things being put together in really different ways. And I think that creates some real challenges for regulators and supervisors because it's, it's moving so fast and a lot of regulators and supervisors don't even have the resources to keep on top of it, right? So I did some work a year ago on digital credit in East Africa. And literally these guys, you know, outside of Zambia at the time didn't really have much of a, a handle on what was going on in the digital credit space. So we need much better tools to monitor what these changes are doing in terms of, of how the financial sector is developing so that we can have those early warning signs and tools to be able to deal with it when there are crises that come out of the digital financial sector. Right now, we're not in that kind of crisis, but you know, we will be. As innovation leads to, to these kinds of changes, we need to be prepared to deal with those changes. So just sort of a plea as people are thinking about how we come out of this to make sure that our regulators and supervisors are appropriately resourced and have the, the ability to kind of monitor some of this wild west new innovation because i think it is going to throw up different kinds of challenges and we're going to need to be nimble to respond to those um, on the universal basic income question you know it's it's really interesting because we've been talking about this in the background at cgap for a while and there are lots of different opinions but this crisis has put ubi right on the front page right i mean we are actually sending out payments in the us to people to keep them afloat because we're asking them not to work so in a way we've kind of got universal basic income through the back door already in the us and lots of other countries in looking at g2p payments are basically giving people money so that they can subsist um, 
when they can't work. So we're already in universal basic income. I think the question is, what happens after the, the crisis goes? You know, I think digital means is a really, um, it, you have to get this money out to people. And the only way you can do it in this sort of situation is digital means, right? And so, as I was saying before, you're seeing countries that are able to do this now because they invested in that kind of infrastructure. And you're seeing countries that have to get the army to deliver it, right? So I think this is a real um, push for countries that want to have um, social protection programs to put in place that kind of distribution architecture so that you can reach people in times of trouble. And then I think it's essentially a, a political question as to whether countries want to continue with some sort of um, universal basic income once the crisis passes. And I think we're going to have really different answers to that. But I think there is going to be a very new view on things like social protection. Um, and certainly in my own country, you know, what we do with healthcare systems when healthcare is linked to employment, right? And so I think this is going to really throw up very um, interesting challenges for us to think about going forward. But what we're seeing in stark relief right now is the need to have those digital systems in place so you can get money out to people now. And, and the U.S. is really struggling with this, frankly, because we haven't invested in those faster payment systems. We don't have really good mechanisms for getting funds out to people. You've seen with the Small Business Administration program, just, they're running out of money. There's not enough. It's not being targeted. And so I, th I think it gives us a real impulse to invest in those kinds of systems going forward. Yeah, great. That's actually very important. I mean, tapping into one of my former lives when I was uh, working actively in the energy sector, it's not so much the production of the energy that's an issue, is how to get the energy from point A to the residents who use it. So essentially you're underscoring the importance of architecture or infrastructure of distribution, that you better build it now before you need it. And those countries, as you said, who've built it are reaping benefits. Those who haven't are scrambling at best, you know, like using the military or whatever to distribute that. So that's an interesting one. So governor, it's a, this is a broad question, but it's an important one to sort of connect and link things together. What do you see as the main financial stability risks arising from COVID-19 impact on financial inclusion? Well, I think the main risk is solvent institutions um, becoming insolvent. Um, you know, the, the biggest risk to, to financial inclusion is financial instability. And even as we try to bring the unbanked and the underbanked and underserved in, and give them access. We have to be very, very concerned about existing financial institutions um, remaining solvent and viable. And if we look at what is going on around the world, including some very large companies within the financial system and outside, including the airlines, for example, um, that is cause for real concern. So the single biggest risk I would say would be uh, prolongation of the economic disruption that leads to a financial crisis and financial instability. Because then the situation is expo exponentially worse and the impact you know, exponentially higher, and wider and deeper on citizens uh, and on our populations. And invariably in those mix, in that mix, the, the under you uh, served and the unserved are uh, disproportionately impacted. So I would say that is the single biggest concern, thinking as a regulator, thinking as an economist, um, that we have at this moment. Can we, can we keep the ship afloat? And will we have enough ventilation? And I speak now of financial ventilation or ventilators for these hitherto solvent institutions to ensure that they can survive this pandemic. If this morphs into a, a financial crisis, then the situation is not just a health problem, it's not just an economic problem, it becomes a, a, a financial stability issue. And, and to me, that is the single biggest risk. So Greta, uh, building on that question, another question is, uh, and I wanna tap into not just your uh, the cap you were at CGAP, but also your wealth of expertise on SMEs. Uh, let's look at a hypothetical scenario where in a few months a vaccine is available and uh, you know, uh, we think we can go back and do everything. How much of this economic damage we are experiencing on a month to month gonna be longer lasting? Uh, or is it more like elastic and we go right away back to work and back to exactly where we were on February 20th or whatever date you wanna pick? 
What's your general sense of the damage that's being caused right now as this thing is prolonging? Um, yeah, um, I think it's huge, actually. I, I mean, I, I don't think, so first of all, I'm not sure we're going to have a vaccine that soon. So I think we are looking at a staged um, reintroduction to whatever the new normal is. Um, and I, I sort of fear that it's going to come in waves, right? And, and, you know, as the governor was pointing out, we're going to have a first round of just trying to get back in our own communities, much less, you know, traveling beyond our own communities and then traveling internationally. And I, I feel for countries that are dependent on tourism because it's just cutting off everything, right? And so the, the damage that's being done right now is huge. And, and I think we are at risk of losing not only some big companies, um, but some a lot of SMEs who, that just don't have access to resources, then they've got a month of cash liquidity that they are playing with, maybe three, right? And so, you know, what we're doing now to get money into their hands is going to be really important. And it's interesting to look at the different approaches being taken by Europe and the US, right? Europe is just paying companies to keep people employed. Uh, the US is sort of dealing with a huge burst of unemployment and then figuring out how to keep companies alive. But you know that comes with a lot of challenges, not least of which is you're leaving people without healthcare. You're gonna have this whole scramble to get businesses open again and get employees back again. So there's a certain inefficiency around that. The problem is both of those things cost a lot of money and not every country has access to those kinds of fiscal resources to, to keep the economy afloat. And so this question of how long T is, like how long is this gonna last is so important because we just don't know how sustained these um, disruptions are gonna be, how they're gonna play out over time. And so it's really hard to understand how you keep your economy afloat. We've already spent you know, upwards of three, four trillion dollars here in the US and this isn't over, right? And so, and, and then, you know, if you take this to emerging markets where you have people working in the informal economy, subsistence kind of livelihoods and, and in countries where there's a lockdown, that's being cut off at the knees. We're looking at people who have nothing to fall back on. We're looking at people who will go hungry. And so, you know, I think the damage is gonna be huge and it's gonna take time to put those supply chains back together. It's gonna to take time for people to get on airplanes and for the tourism sector to come back. It's gonna take time before people are comfortable going going down to the mall and, you know, being around a lot of other people or going to a restaurant. And so, you know, I think this is going to be with us for a long time and we have to just get ready to ride this out over a, a year or two. Um, and, and, you know, there'll be loosening and tightening and we're just going to have to figure out how to roll with that. Um, and, you know, I, I think you mentioned um, somewhere that, you know, the world banks come out with, new figures saying huge numbers of people could fall back into extreme poverty. So, you know, it, it really is quite serious. And, and we're going to need to, as, as Governor Antoine was saying, work together. I mean, this is a global crisis. We need global solutions. And, and this isn't a time for kind of winner takes all kind of stuff. We really need to pull together because the world is globalized and that's not going to change. Um, so we're going to need all the resources we can get. Thank you. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, sorry. Thank you. What that was that? a downer. I didn't mean to end things on a... a no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. It's actually good to... I mean, the thing is we got to uh, give it to the people straight up. There's no need to sugarcoat or put a rosy color on this. I mean, that's the whole point of being in a crisis to figure out what to do and how to navigate it and then get out. Governor, we're coming to the end, and I'm wondering if you have, in a very short span of time, any uh, final sage uh, observation for us as we're all kind of cooped up at home some jurisdictions in some countries, uh, I think as early as this Friday, are opening up their massage parlors and tattoo parlors. So I think they're way too optimistic. But for the rest of us who are based on uh, work on science and things of that nature, any last uh, words that you want to leave us with? Well, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Somebody said that a long time ago, and I agree. It, it does present opportunity. Every crisis does. It does present opportunities. So even as we struggle with this period of surviving as it were, and learning to live with or coexist with COVID-19, we have to have an eye on the future. And that future requires us to learn the lessons of this pandemic and embrace the opportunities. So whether that is with respect to pandemic planning, uh, business continuity and resilience planning, uh, social safety nets, a digital transformation, a food security, financial inclusion, 
Those are areas which present opportunities for us to be better as a world, as, a, as an individual country, but as a globe. And to me, we need to focus on that. And if we do that, it will be a while yet, but we will come out stronger when we do emerge from this pandemic. And that is my enduring hope, Baba, brother, <clears throat> and all of our colleagues. That is my enduring hope, that ultimately we will emerge stronger because we will approach the lessons with humility and but with a growth mindset that we can and must come out stronger. And that is my, um, that is my intent. That is my, I have every intention doing my own little role here at this ECCB and in our region to help push that growth mindset coming out of this pandemic. Yeah, um, one of the privileges of interviewing thoughtful people is we end up with really thoughtful answers as the end, especially as we come too close. Thank you for that. And also to our audience, uh, viewers, my apologies for not being able to address every single question that you posed, but those questions will not go to waste. Uh, we actually are parking questions from this and other series, and we will integrate them into our programming or other things. And also we may go back to the speakers and ask them to provide some thoughts on that through some kind of a publication or whatever. Thank you. The two of you did an amazing job. I'm really grateful. And as I like to say, you really kicked ass. And thank you again for being such good partners of Toronto Center and helping the global community. And uh, bless you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.